Well, we're here in Philadelphia with Dr. Marin, and uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about the ischemia trial. And um, what I'd like to start off asking you about is the uh, ischemia CKD trial. How does it differ from the uh, ischemia trial in terms of design? Well, obviously the, the big difference is the population that was recruited. And they were patients that had a GFR less than 30 or were on dialysis. And in terms of the entry into the trial, a couple of design differences. The stress tests were not reviewed by core laboratories, and there were no CT coronary angiograms performed. Because of the impaired renal function, we didn't want to uh, expose the patients to that dye load. So patients were uh, entered without a CCTA, so there was no uh, method to exclude left main disease or no obstructive disease um, that involved imaging. It was purely uh, physician judgment. So I wanted to elaborate a little bit more um, in the uh, arm that went and got an actual calf. What precautions and how was the uh, calf actually conducted um, for these patients who had advanced renal disease? So special precautions were made to uh, try to avoid contrast injury to the uh, kidneys. And so uh, the methods used for hydration in the Poseidon trial were advocated for the patients that were randomizedly invasive strategy. And uh, low contrast uh, imaging was uh, recommended. These guidelines were given to all of the sites. And so uh, those were the main interventions, the main differences in the way that the cardiac catheterization and PCI was performed. So do you think this would be uh, applicable uh, to a wide range of centers that may perhaps not be as efficient or uh, capable of performing low or zero contrast uh, with intracoronary imaging? Well, you bring up a good point, and that is that sites were carefully selected based on their the quality of their outcomes and the volume. And so our results may not be applicable to sites that are not familiar with those procedures. That said, given the results that suggest that there is no compelling reason to send patients to the cath lab in the ischemia CKD trial, Unless somebody is very symptomatic, um, I think the, the results are less site-specific, um, but would apply only to patients that would be referred to the cath lab. So I think based on our results, in stable patients with advanced CKD, there's not a lot of evidence to support referral. To the cath lab at all. So since we're on the topic of referrals to the cath lab, um, we get a lot of patients uh, as part of their pre-renal transplant evaluation uh, where the transplant services want an angiogram for patients um, and you know irrespective of uh, their symptomatology. So how does the ischemia trial fit in to that population? It's very frustrating for me as a practicing cardiologist when I am asked by the, the transplant team, uh, transplant evaluation team, to refer a patient for testing and specifically for a coronary angiogram that is asymptomatic and uh, may or may not have ischemia, it, it, it doesn't, it hasn't made sense to me. And now with the findings of the ischemia CKD trial, there's even less of a reason. However, 
as a compassionate person, I don't want to deny the patient the transplant that they desperately need. So, you know, we're sort of subject to doing whatever we're asked to do to permit the patient to have a transplant. So I hope that the nephrologists will take note of the results of this trial and reconsider these rules. Do you think it would be appropriate an appropriate argument to say that the uh, rate of stroke was a little higher in the, uh, re the revascularization arm in the CCD patients, and so we have to be careful when we uh, consider a uh, invasive approach in these patients? That's a great point, and another one in the case of the renal transplant candidate, another reason not to. Yeah. But you're absolutely right. We really don't understand the mechanism for that finding. There was no difference in, uh, I mean, the, the excess strokes seen in the invasive strategy were not procedure related for the most part, the vast majority. Perhaps it's the substrate, the patients themselves. Or perhaps, um, well, the substrate was the same in both treatment groups. So. Was it because of the dual antiplatelet therapy? Possibly. Um, we, we don't know the answer yet, and we're going to dig deeper to try to understand the mechanism. So since we're on the topic of the antiplatelet therapy, um, you know, one thing that was noticed in the ischemia trial itself, and not just in particular the ischemia CKD, um, was the uh, spontaneous MIs, that they were actually lower uh, in the revascularization arm. Could it be attributed to the dual antiplatelet rather than the revascularization uh, itself? Might well be. We need to dig deeper. Um, we, we haven't had the data available that long, and so we don't, we haven't looked to try to, to, to understand that and tease that apart. Um, the, it would be very interesting to know um, MI rate in patients post PCI versus post CADI, because one would think, based on all that we know so far, that it's uh, cabbage that's more likely to prevent uh, a spontaneous MI than PCI. And yet, in FAME 2, we saw a clear signal of uh, fewer spontaneous MIs in the invasive strategy. And it, it may well be DAPT, the dual antiplatelet therapy. We, we don't know, and we're going to be studying to figure it out. The focus of the ischemia trial was a composite endpoint, but we also saw uh, presented earlier today the uh, quality of life, and we saw an improvement, particularly in patients who uh, had angina. So, can you just comment a little bit on that? Well, I would say that we saw virtually all of the improvement in quality of life in patients who had angina. There was uh, very little evidence of an improvement in quality of life in patients who are asymptomatic at baseline. And we, we, can't, we can't exclude the possibility that there's a small benefit in people who are asymptomatic, but that's not, uh, that the signal was clearly in patients who had angina at baseline. Those are the ones who benefited in terms of quality of life with a high degree of confidence. The question then comes down to uh, is going through the procedure something that the patient wants? Uh, it, it will depend on their, their own personal values and preferences once they understand, once they're informed about what the risks and benefits are from an invasive strategy. So, how do you think overall the ischemia trial, uh, whether it's ischemia CKD or the quality of life or the main trial, how will it impact clinical practice? With a comment on the role of CT, because that was, you know, a screening method in the beginning. There's a lot to unpack there. Uh, you, you threw in CKD with that question. So, I'll, I'll start with CKD. I think that if a patient is has advanced CKD, 
and at least moderate ischemia, and is very symptomatic, that it's reasonable to attempt a revascularization procedure to go the invasive route. Um, that, that would be a reasonable decision if the patient has a, 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 a quality of life that's unacceptable to them. But there's um, very little reason to go to the cath lab for any other uh, scenario in a patient with CP. The question, the second question, as I understand, is about the use of CT in, let's say, in patients that don't have um, renal disease, because we didn't do CT angiography in those with uh, CKD. First, a, a comment about why we, we put that into the design, and it was, number one, for safety. We wanted to exclude patients with left main disease. But we learned uh, an additional bonus from having that procedure was that we could identify people who had no obstructive disease. So that way we didn't randomize them and dilute our power to find a difference should one exist. So we found, as I think you know, 9% of patients who qualified on the basis of a stress test were found to have at least a 50% left main stenosis and they were excluded. And about 20% of patients had no obstructive disease defined as nothing more than 50% in a major coronary vessel. And since we found in people who were screened out uh, with no obstructive disease and no left main disease, uh, our results really apply to that population. And so it's a very relevant question, what is the application in, in practice? This, of course, goes beyond the scope of the research, and I'm giving you my own opinion, but I think that because of the way we designed the trial, that it is something that we're going to need to consider in practice now to exclude patients with left main before deciding to pursue a conservative strategy. And that means, for the most part, it's probably a coronary CT angiogram. And I think that begs another question, which is what is the role of stress testing? So one of the lowest hanging fruit take home points from this, from the, the main ischemia trial is that there's very little justification to send a patient without any symptoms to the cath lab for revascularization. Now, if left main is suspected, it would be very reasonable to do a coronary CT angiogram. However, we perform a lot of revascularization on patients who have no symptoms. And if we stopped doing that, in the United States, we would save over $500 million per year. And there was a lot of concern about the cost of doing the ischemia trial, which cost $100 million roughly over eight years. And I think that the return on investment, if the results are translated into practice, is huge. Thank you for your time and uh, the insight that you gave us. And um, we're looking for long-term maybe follow-up from the ischemia trial. Is that something planned by the investigators? Well, the investigators want to do that. It'll be up to NIH whether or not we get funding. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it.